And using BSM, what we find is, is a kind of normative model of what organisations need to be to be viable. And we find faults of commission and faults of omission. And Michael here has just done an astonishing piece of work that we can't talk about because he hasn't actually done his defence of his PhD. But um, directly relates it to organisational crisis. Yes, Michael? Yes, sir. With a 0.78 correlation. Between system viability and the occurrence of organisational crisis. Yeah. So it is a pretty strong predictor of your ability to not be in, in a crisis. So actually having some decent statistically valid statist um, empirical evidence. Um, kind of useful, I thought. And hopefully you're going to come and talk about it sometime, aren't you? Sure. Yeah. So, um, dominant model that most people refer to um, is the um, hierarchy model. Um, so, first developed after a train crash in the US when they wanted to discover um, who was responsible for it. And they gave the job to the guy who designed the switch gear. So, he used the same modeling technique for that. So really good at what it does, which is power responsibility, ultimately blame. Not so great at some other quite important stuff, like what the organisation does and how it does it. So, colourful bag of knitting on the left-hand side is the viable system model, um, developed by yeah. Beer as a science organisation. So this is a presentation to, in a group of um, several to one, really, Julia. So you don't have to you don't have to tiptoe quite so much. Um, so what Beer was after was the invariant laws of organisation that would underpin any type of system, so biological systems, social systems, organisational systems. So we tend to draw this, and this is this is Mr. Whitler's territory, um, as a, a sort of wiring diagram. Um, because it's actually built around understanding how the organisation deals with complexity. So it's actually a graphical representation of a set of complexity equations. But quite a lot of stuff in there, so structures and processes and how it takes decisions and communication and how it manages performance and adaptation and that sort of stuff. Yeah. So it looks horribly complicated, but it's not really. It's really, really dead simple. There's only five things, or if you might, or six. So it starts with um, circles, which are the operations, so the primary activities of the organisation, and what we're doing is looking, trying to separate those out from the other stuff. So this is about the, the things that the organisation does that provide value to the external environment. And in modelling, we're separating those out from everything else the organisation has to do to keep itself in being. So for a university like this, or a business school like this, um, doing research is primary, teaching is primary, uh, running the building is not. Yeah. And in modelling you break that down level by level or build it up level by level. So one of the things we're interested in is how that structured. So um, each blob here has a number of subsystems with it and we can take each one of those and break that down into another couple of subsystems and break that down and carry on doing that organisational structure breakdown. And that's done according to four types of complexity in organisations. So you either organi split organisations by task doing different things, or by customer doing it for different people, or by geography, or by time. And the order in which you do that has a massive impact on what the organisation is good at and what it's bad at. So we put up productivity in the factory by 40% within a week just by changing that. Didn't change the kit, didn't change the people, didn't retrain, just changed the organising logic. So that's the sort of um, the breakdown of the operations. And then we've got a series of things that build it back into a coherent whole. So the first of these is coordination. So this is set of mechanisms to stop one set of operations screwing things up for the, for the others. And it tends to be sort of quite passive things like protocols and schedules and common standards of common languages, that sort of thing. Um, in most organisations, massively underestimated in, in importance. So it's one of the biggest factors in organisational efficiency. Um, and it tends to be, I mean, you, you tend not to get promoted for, for putting this stuff in. 
um, certainly in the West, you know, you get, to, you get promoted for firefighting, and this is about fire prevention. So where that breaks down, um, you get typical set of symptoms, so conflicts over resource, turf wars, conflicting messages to customers, because Department A will say, you can have it next week, and Department B goes, mm, we're not starting our bit until next month. And weak operations planning, so all the stuff that's in lean about smoothing flow is, 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 in, is in this bit. And when that breaks down, you get appeals to higher levels of management to come and sort out the inter-unit spats. So we've got a set of about 20 recurring pathologies that we see again and again and again. And this is one of the really, 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 really common ones. So it's, it's very rare to walk into an organisation and not see examples of this. So the circles are operations, and the boxes in this model are about managing. And we've got a set of, a, a part of management, which is about ensuring that the, the beast delivers. And so when we talk to organisations about this, um, very often they, they'll say, for example, yeah, we've got some performance measures, but it's vanishingly unclear what their actual measures are. So part of this is about being really, really specific about what the linkage is between decisions about operations and the actual operations themselves. So there's a, a vertical, so if you think this is a um, department with two teams in, and we've got the department <coughs> management and the, the team management. So part of this is about um, agreeing performance. So what performance do you need from me, you know, as the department, as you need from the team? And how are we going to measure that? And reciprocally, what resources are available to do that? So that, that sort of um, basic spinal relationship that's sort of core in any organisation is that resource bargain. If I give you this level of resource, can you deliver this level of performance, yes or no? And we have a negotiation about that. And this goes spectacularly wrong a lot of the time. So one way in which it goes wrong is fragmentation. I end up having one conversation with Pete about performance and a different kind of conversation with Jonathan about resource. And neither of them talk to one another. Um, and it's in Pete's interest to screw me on performance and it's in Jonathan's interest to screw me on resource and I end up squeezed in the middle. So this is the quickest way to break individuals, teams, departments. Um, we've got a member, Christoph, who is a occupational physician and his record is 13 people in the same job broken um, by this um, before anybody noticed there was a pattern. So we just thought, you know, not very good people, but actually it's, it's, it's totally systemic. Second thing that goes wrong with it, really, really common, is the control dilemma. So something happens to change demand from the environment. Operations guys react. Um, management panics at loss of control and tends to demand more and more reporting. So you get into this, this sort of vicious cycle, really. And the operational guys then get hit at two levels. One is the, the, uh, the organisation gets hit at two levels. So the operational guys are distracted, I mean half their attention is trying to fight off the senior managers um, and you've got the senior managers so they tend to fail and the senior managers are failing because they're trying to micromanage something they don't really understand rather than actually dealing with the next strategic issue they're supposed to be dealing with. So you get, kind of get a double, double hit there. The way out of it is this little understood thing, the monitoring loop, which is going down from one level of management, bypassing the next level of management, so from department to bypassing the team management, and looking at what's actually happening on the ground in reality. And this tends to be qualitative, when performance metrics are, are quantitative, this tends to be qualitative. qualitative. So doing a job with Greater Manchester Fire and Rescue, which is the second thing to do in the country, and had the number two guy in the room, and I hadn't spoken to him about this, but I said to him, you do this, don't you? Because I just knew what sort of guy he was. He said, yeah, still got on a shout. Uh, why do you do it? I do it because since I was a firefighter, things have changed and I need to go out on a shine to understand what my firefighters are dealing with. 
and, and get that, that deep understanding so that I can actually interpret what they say when they tell me what's going on. So in VSM, we've got a really, really set of simple constructs around actually making sure that the beast delivers. Um, it's about linking operations to decisions about those and being clear in the governance sense who's taking what decisions about what operations. Agreeing and measuring performance, agreeing the resources, and monitoring to check it works. And you've just got the same structure replicated at every level. Um, if you get into designing governance systems, you see almost all the rules of this broken on a regular basis um, with the inevitable um, opening for crisis to happen as a result. So then we've got another set of part of management, which is done in blue, which is about looking outside and into the future. So this tends to be stuff like surveying technical, competitive market governance, predicting planning, R&D, innovation, and strategic risk. And again, this tends to be, um, this is one of the really, really, really common absences in, in organisations. Uh, and where that fails, you get a classic set of, of uh, symptoms. So mismatch, essentially, between what the organisation does and what the organisation needs to be doing, and that shows up in various forms. This could be a very long list, Nikki, couldn't it? <laughs> there, are, there are more ways of this going wrong than you can yeah. sh shake a stick at, so yes, absolutely. Um, the one that I think is scariest, and I think does speak to your stuff, Michael, is, is the um, overcome by strategic risk. So S&P 500, top 500 companies in the US, 85 have failed over 40 years. This is pre-credit crisis, this is 2006. Again, 2006 figures, top 1,000 companies in the world, half lost 20% of their cap value in one month at some time over a decade. 35% of fatal strategic risk come from a direction they didn't even think they ought to be looking in. Not just that they weren't looking in, but it hadn't occurred to them to, to look in. So you kind of, uh, you kind of got to look where the, the lions are, not where the lions aren't. So in BSM, decision making is about balancing that external <coughs> blue stuff with the internal, the red stuff, between the future and now. Um, and that articulated through the organisation. So it's two, in an information design kind of way, it's two completely different sorts of information feed. Um, it's not an exact science, but we reckon you can 80, 70, 80% predict what a, a management team will decide if you look at the information flowing in. So it's a, it's a really, really, really strong predictor of what people are going to decide in, is in the information design. So we start, with, we start with a decision and say what information you need rather than the other way about, which is kind of worrying in a big data world where people think they can just assemble a whole load of random shit and the answer will pop out. Not that I'm biased. So, um, in VSM, this is about reconciling the, the inside and now with the future and outside. It's about building a conversational space where those discussions can happen naturally. We tend to, or conventional management tends to sort of string that into a linear process, and that absolutely doesn't work. Um, so, if you think about this, um, in terms of a product development, for example, you might come up with the product development people might come up with the product, speak to operations, can you deliver this? Well, we haven't actually got the people, but we could get the people, but then finance go, no, you can't have the money, you need to actually recruit people. And you can see how that conversation might need to sort of spin around several times. That really, really natural social process kind of gets broken in conventional strategic thinking because we stretch that out into a um, straight line process which fails most of the time. Patrick, on, on that, something I saw that never occurred to me before, but a couple of them have got different names depending on which level they're in, but some have the same name, don't they? And I'm very familiar with, with issues between sales and marketing, and issues between operations and product development. 
Yeah, but there's going to be a visible bond between bits of HR and other bits of HR and bits of finance yeah. and other bits of finance, which yeah. may be less visible because they're part of the same organisation. But there's, um, <coughs> yeah, but if you look, if you look, for example, at HR, that it's quite schizoid. So you've got a side of HR which is very transactional, mm -hmm. which is about pay and rations and discipline and blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. and a side which is about development. Yeah. And they actually philosophically are quite, <coughs> quite divorced from one another. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah? So that, that's, that all gets lumped together into HR, but it's, it's kind of trying to do two very different things with two completely different philosophical bases. Obviously and in big organisations... It worse if you've got the same name, you know. Yeah, yeah, because you try to smurf it together, and it it often doesn't. So if you get if you look at big organisations where they've gone business partners for HR, you tend to get one or t'other. You tend, you know, they tend not to. The same person tends not to do both of those things well, because they get torn apart internally because they're, they're philosophically quite different. But, but it's interesting that that is that's explicitly addressed by the HR and the finance thing in all of the. Uh, Literature and the simplistic models and consultants like me use for target operating models for finance and HR. And the focus is always how can we get our head up above the transactional to do the strategic and the transformational a lot yeah. more. There's, there's, there's a quadrant diagram with things moving in, but the spider diagram moving, which is a famous one that some, I can't remember, I used to know the name of. Uh, so, um, all of that says that traditionally HR and finance are in system three and then you need a system four as well. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, there's not well, an easy fix, is yeah, there, Ben? Well, except there's a city council I work for where they put um, uh, HR and finance under the transformation director, and they woke up one day with a £40 million black hole in their operational budget, which is pretty good illustration, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've seen, the same, I, I mean, I've seen that with finance VPs as well. You know, they're great at half the job. So that's, that's BSM, um, really, really, really simple rule set, um, just replicated at every level of the organisation and what it's really about is ensuring that organisational systems are capable of dealing with situations that could not have been anticipated when they were first designed. And that's that.